are we looking at housing as shelter or are we looking at as an mm, investment asset? Mm. And at the moment, how it stands, it's very clear that the vast majority of New Zealanders or those that can afford property are looking at it as both. Welcome to Slice, property made possible. We're a platform on a mission to reduce barriers to home ownership. This podcast is a safe space for our community to learn together and build the confidence required to start on their property journey. When you're ready to start, head along to slicedubai.com and sign up for your free dashboard. Welcome back to Slice the Podcast. We're super excited to have Professor Paul Spoonley joining us today. Welcome, Paul. Hi, Amy. Did you want to give us a bit of a breakdown? Because we were talking before, obviously, you've had a wealth of experience and, and done a lot of different things. Did you want to share a little bit about your background with us today? Yes, what, what I did over the last decade was lead a major team that looked at changing demography of New Zealand and particularly migration and what that, how that impacted upon New Zealand in terms of its diversity. And so we also did a program of research called Nga Tangata Oho Mairangi, which looked at what New Zealand would look like in 2038. These days I'm, I'm doing quite different things, but I did a book in 21 which looked at that demography and I continue to do research and talk about it. Yeah, and when it comes to, you know, experts in demography in New Zealand, you really are it. Oh, so, thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. And another thing that we were just speaking about off camera before was you've been advising in Cabinet. You said BIMS. BIMS? BIMS, Briefs for in- Incoming Ministers. And so I'm part of a unit which is attached to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And so we're busy looking at, you know, a changed political landscape and what that might mean at the moment. But we provide advice to the incoming ministers. Awesome. It's very topical at the moment. We're sort of shooting this two days after the election. So as you said beforehand, you've got a new boss in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. And there'll be big changes, but yet not sure what those look like yet. Yeah, totally. Well, I think it'd be great to just touch on sort of what we are seeing in terms of immigration, migration trends, what the difference actually is between immigration and migration as well, just breaking down some of those basics for our audience so that we can then sort of moot what what some of these trends may mean for the housing market. Well, it really began to change about 2013. So during the global financial crisis, we saw a major outflow of New Zealanders and we didn't see too many migrants. And of course, migrants don't come during an economic downturn. And then after 2013, through the John Key government, but then the subsequent Jacinda Ardern government, we saw the numbers increase and increase. And they got to a a really new high in early 2020. And then, of course, COVID happened. So we saw it bottom out. Yeah. But now where we are in 2023, the migrants are coming back. The net gains are just extraordinary. So we... As we're kind of out of COVID, Canada's tended to set the benchmark in terms of what it's looking for in terms of migration. If you do the numbers proportionate to the population, we're almost double the number of migrants coming to New Zealand compared to those going to Canada. Wow. Because it's proportionate to population, of course. And so when you our think latest... about it, Canada's a lot closer to, yeah. to, to go. <laughs> yes, yeah. When you, the latest figures show a net gain of 110,000, and that includes the net loss of New Zealanders of over 40,000. Yeah. So we're seeing New Zealanders go, but the numbers coming on shore are just extraordinary. Yeah, so basically I guess you've got your, your comings and goings, but net being the result, the difference the between difference the two. Between them. Yep. So 110,000 and like 400 or something, the last I checked, yeah. of actually we're in, in the positive or excess. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So th- the previous high was in, in 2013. And when what we saw then was a number which is literally half of what we're seeing now at the moment. So you know, it's just historically, it's just high. And it's it's the highest population growth rate of any country in the OECD. So when you add the numbers of incoming migrants or the net gain from migration and what we call natural increase, which is the number of births minus deaths, New Zealand's population growth this year will probably be 
2.4, 2 2.5, 2.6%. And for the average for the OECD, 0.6%. So like wow. New Zealand's way out ahead. What do you think's causing that? Do you well, know? migration. Yeah, 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 net migration. So, And just New Zealand being a des desirable yes, country to come yes, to? Yeah. Yes. So a few weeks ago, there was a major media survey in the United States surveying Americans, and they said, what, what are the most desirable countries in the world? New Zealand was number two, wow. and the USA, remember these Americans talking about desirable countries, the USA was number three. So I don't think we quite appreciate how desirable we are. People don't come here to make money, generally. They come here to work, but they come for the lifestyle. Mm. And so they're pouring into the country at the moment. Yeah, that's insane. I had no idea. Mm. And like within the States, that's, that's nuts. One of yes. the, the factors that I did consider when purchasing my first home, so yes. I bought in Raglan. I originally was trying to buy in Auckland and couldn't afford, and I ended up going with Raglan. And mm. one of the reasons I went with it was whenever I went to Raglan, there were a lot of Americans there. Mm. And my thinking was, well, if Americans love it, like <laughs> there's always going to be some demand yes. for you know this particular area. So yes. that was actually one of the big factors that I considered then. And Northland's the same. So yeah. if you go to Bay of Ireland, same sort of dynamic. But what I need to make clear in terms of the housing market, between 50 and 60% of those incoming migrants go to Auckland. So even though there's a move out of Auckland and the net loss to other regions is around 12,000 from Auckland, the combination of these very high inward migration and natural increase, so we have more births in Auckland than anywhere else in the country. So Auckland is growing super fast. And we think over the next two decades, we'll probably see an extra 500 to 700,000 people in Auckland. And that will mean about 40% of all New Zealanders will be living in Auckland. Yeah, I mean, with the, even now, right, there's a mm. massive population there, but that's really interesting to think about yes. what impact that's going to have on Auckland and housing. Because mm. I've, I've sort of been interested in particular as well, when it comes to population growth, you know, what kind of that impact might be on housing and housing demand? Because we know... It, when it is, you know, returning New Zealanders, they do tend to try and buy property, mm -hmm. where it's uh, migrants, it can be that they're just renting. Yes. So it's hard to kind of quantify exactly yes. what that looks like for the housing market. Well, I, I think you're right to say that migrants divide up. But what we do know is that when migrants come here and spend, their one-off spend for cars, white wear, or houses is much higher than it is for New Zealanders. So they are a major part of our housing market. But, of course, they go for the new builds. So when we look around Auckland, we look at two things in terms of the migrant pressure on housing. One is uh, our school zones, and the second is the new builds around the, what's called the periurban fringe. So if you go north to Oriwa or to Long Bay or you go south, you will see the migrant demand for new housing there. And, and certainly where I am, which is in, in Tor Bay, as soon as I go, go north, you know, the people building the houses tend to be migrants, uh, like the, the people, the, 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 the chippies and the, and the sparkies and so on, uh, and the people buying the houses tend to be migrants, new migrants. Mm. So we can see that demand and around we, the edges of Auckland. And we definitely don't have the supply. I mean, we no. don't want to dive into politics today. I won't do that to you. No. Um, but, you know, when it comes to some of it, we did a post the other day talking about what each of the parties are campaigning on when it comes to Kiwi Build or, mm. you know, at the end of the day, not one of the parties sort of has a massive plan to increase that supply. So what can we expect, you know? Well, the, the Economist a few weeks ago looked at what they called Maison for All, so Houses for All, and they've got a graph there. And what's interesting about New Zealand is New Zealand's at the bottom of the graph, and the graph has the number of houses per 100 people. So France is at the top with 55. New Zealand's down in the 20s, and what you see is that New Zealand has a little bit of a spurt and then drops off. And that drop-off is because we're not building enough houses compared to population growth. So when you look at Europe, the population growth is very, very minor. So if you look at a place like Germany, 
there are more deaths than births in Germany. So Germany is not growing at all, really. But New Zealand's growing has been growing at about 2.1%. And mm -hmm. I think this year it'll grow by 2.5%. I mean, that's high. It's high compared to any other high-income country. And what we're not doing is we're just not providing infrastructure and services and housing for that level of population growth. Yeah, and when it comes to, I guess, housing solutions, you may not have sort of addressed this when it comes to kind of considering the needs of migrants as they move into New Zealand, but have you seen anything sort of work well overseas that we should be considering here in New Zealand? Well, the, the difficulty is that very few countries attract migrants at the rate we do. Canada and Australia do, but most countries do not. So when we're looking overseas, it's actually difficult to identify who you would look at. Canada, Australia, yes, but most of Europe, no. So the two things that you notice is that, first of all, their population growth is quite minor compared to ours. And secondly, they've always had a very large rental market. And I think that the, when you look at New Zealand, what's interesting there is the generational shift. And so I'm a baby boomer and my generation own houses. If you look at the under 30s, then the, the level of home ownership has just dropped hugely. So, uh, and it's continuing to drop. And so what you're seeing is entry into the housing market of the millennials and generation Z because they've got debt because of housing is super expensive in New Zealand. I mean, there's a ratio between medium household income and the cost of a new house of a factor of nine. Yeah, the when debt I bought to my income house, ratio. Yeah. So basically how much huge. you need to, you know, borrow yeah. in relation to your income. And yes. you can't necessarily serve that amount of borrowing. No. And so that's what, it, what makes it hard for a lot of New Zealanders to yes. actually get lending at the moment. And can I say there are demographic consequences? So when we look at millennials and Generation Z, what you notice is that they're very often boomeranging to a, a, a family home. So we're seeing more and more people in their late 20s still living in a family home. They might have gone away and studied, but they're now back. If they're forming a relationship, it tends to be in their late 20s, early 30s. If they're going to have a family, then typically it's in their 30s. So most children are now born to women in their 30s. But we're also seeing the number of women who are millennials of Generation Z who are choosing not to have children or to have one and done. So there's what we call beanpole households, which is where you've got different generations in the same household. And then, of course, when they do go into the housing market, very often it's mum and dad. Mm. The bank of mum and dad is now... Fifth biggest in Australasia. In Australia yeah, fourth biggest in New Zealand. Yeah. So it's, it's right there. And, it, you know, baby boomers like myself are having this debate. Do we loan them the money? Do we gift them the money? Do we charge interest? How much do we give them? Do we raid our own savings? So there's a sort of intergenerational debate that's and going on. And how does that impact your retirement and, you know, yes. and your financial future? I, so, I want to have fun, you know. Yeah. I, I, you know, I want to spend my money. And you've worked a lot, Paul. Yes, you know, thank you deserve you. it. Thank you, thank um, you. So are you actually looking at supporting a child or is that something? Yeah, no, no, yeah. no, absolutely. We're, we're typical of most baby boomers. I mean, it, it, there's two things. One is that we continue. So we've got sons in our 30s and we continue to support them in various ways, including financially. But the big one is, are they going to buy a house? Mm. And, and how do we help them with that purchase? And if they're living in your house anyway, you know, you might want mm. to help them get out and yes, into their own. Yes. Well, and, and that's interesting because, as, you know, as these kids, be, you know, we, we've got, in our case, we had, we had a son, his wife, and a ch young child come back and live with us for some months. You see, and it, you know, suddenly you, you go from an empty nest to having, to having um, people back in your household. There's another thing which I think we're beginning to look at, which is called hoarding or blocking, which is that the baby boomers are continuing to own quite big houses. So we don't have family members in our house now, but there's two of us who live in one bedroom, and we've got four bedrooms in that house. So... One of the things you notice is that there are what called excess bedrooms yeah. in a place like Auckland in particular, where baby boomers are sitting on houses 
that whether are, are bigger than what they need. Yeah, bigger than what they need. So they've got all these bedrooms that are not being used. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that's where there is that, as you say, it's almost like a a passing of assets, which is going to occur and is mm. occurring, you know, more readily by the day. But what will that look like today? It looks probably a lot like our customers supporting their children into homes. And yes. that, to, to your point there around how do you do that, I've just recorded a podcast episode with my mum. So okay. she helped me into my first property. Good, good old mum. Yeah, good yeah. old mum. Yes. And, yeah, she's a grafter. So we we came to an agreement around what that might mm. look like. And I think it's important that, you know, if you are supporting your children, you just get comfortable with whatever's going to work for you and your circumstances, whether that's, you know, a loan yeah. with interest, a guarantee, or a gift if you're, you know, yes. so fortunate to be able to offer that. Yes, and, and, and it's difficult because these are highly personal relationships, you know. It's not like going to a bank. It, it can be difficult and the conversation can be difficult. Mm. And so do you get external advice? Do you uh, negotiate it yourself? If there's an agreement, what does that agreement look like? If you've got multiple kids, do you have to do the same for each of those kids? Yeah. You know, it, it is. It's not an easy set of circumstances and I think we're moving into a very different era. I, I would argue as a demographer, the 2020s are unlike anything we've ever seen before. And, and these sorts of arrangements are unlike anything we've seen before. And, and we don't have a template. We don't have a plan. Slice. Yeah. <laughs> or do we, Paul? Yeah, yes. so, I mean, that's, that's essentially what we support with is we act as that objective model and we have a bunch of lawyers that support you through those conversations. But that's sort of one, you know, one part of a solution. I mean, as you quite rightly said before, when you've got properties where perhaps you've got, you know, too many bedrooms or too much space for what's actually required, mm. you know, then we're looking at potentially reverse mortgages and we do have a lot of customers coming in to discuss that yes. where potentially they want their children to buy them out of the home or they want to downsize and so there's like there's a few different types of shifts to I guess move assets and wealth between the generations now. Yes and and that intergenerational wealth transfer is going to be huge so at the moment we have a pay-as-you-go superannuation system as an over 65 year old I, I'm eligible for that but you're paying for that. Yeah. It's a pay-as-you-go system. It's not like I've paid taxes and I'm suddenly getting those taxes back. It's actually funded, leaving aside the Cullen Fund, it's actually funded by people who are currently working, paying, yeah, working and paying income tax. Yeah. So sometime we're going to have to have a discussion about that because, you know, our millennials, our Generation Z, going to want to continue to fund that because it's not simply the increase in cost of super, it's health care. It's the provision of intensive care beds. So there's a whole lot of things that are wrapped up in that. And then do we have a housing market which allocates according to need? And probably probably not. I mean, could my kids afford my house? No, of course they can't. It's mm. too expensive. Yeah, so there is going to have to be that kind of transfer. And I guess a lot of it probably we're assuming is going to just come through, um, I guess, your estate. Yes. We're going to We're going to see a lot of people in here at properties, but still at an unequal level of where you've got a certain percentage owning all of those yes. properties. Can I say two things, Amy? One is that we're living much longer. So at the age of 65, my generation will expect to live around 23, 24 years. And your generation will live longer than that. A, a female, Pākehā female born at the moment, is likely to have, this year in 2023, is likely to have a life expectancy of 94, which means almost half of her generation will live to be 100. So the idea that you reach 65 and then within 10 years you might be dead and your children inherit is no longer the case. Mm. And, and, and we're just living longer and longer. But the other thing is that we're seeing alternative housing options. So beanpole family households are where you see three generations in the in same the household. Home, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's going to be a new option. Co-housing is going to be a new option. New forms of ownership are going to be option where you, you, you rent but purchase over a longer term, mm -hmm. but you might not own the land. You might only own the house. So I, I just think we, we need to open it up. The traditional ways of 
home ownership. Home ownership probably are not going to work. Yeah, not at not not, not for at everybody. the general level. No, yeah, no, yeah. no. Yeah, for I some, should... for some lucky. People. Oh yeah, absolutely. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> but, but, yeah. yeah, it does become you know well. Actually, how can we fairly allocate mm. the resources that we have and, yes. the, and the shelter that we have? Because I guess that at a fundamental level, housing is shelter. Yes. If you look at the future population growth over the next two decades, what you discover is that a lot of that growth is in Auckland, Tauranga and Hamilton. So other metropolitan centres like Wellington and Christchurch will grow a little. In the regions, some towns, I'm from Hawke's Bay, so Hastings and Havelock North will grow a little bit. Napier probably won't grow a lot. But when you get outside those uh, centres, there won't be a lot of population growth and we're going to see stagnation and we might see population decline. So what's already happening in the west coast of the South Island or in Southland? So our housing market is going to look very different over the next two decades, depending upon where you live in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is, again, kind of creating further disparity. Yes, <laughs> yes it is. Because they, I mean, we, we call it hyper-aging, but there are going to be towns in New Zealand where the majority of the population is going to be aged over 65. Mm. So who's going to buy their houses? Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I'm actually from Hawke's Bay originally too, oh, okay. Paul, so we have that in common. Yes. But, but, yeah, I mean, you're right. We're going to end up with these pockets potentially of properties that are all sort of owned by by that generation and it does become interesting to think about what that handover could look like yes. and whether or not we can enable that yes. so through you know there's a few few ways through actually helping children into new homes but also potentially through helping those children into your existing homes mm. and finding something more fit for purpose yes. or cohabitating yes um, so I'm, you might move to a new option which might have adjacent housing yeah. in which you live, because you only need, as a baby boomer, you might only need one bedroom, two bedrooms, but next door you've got the family, which might need two or three bedrooms. Yeah, so even mm. building on existing land yes. potentially, or, you know, so that you've got yeah. dual complexes. Yeah. I mean, it'll be super interesting. I think from a, you know, we are a Western sort of country at the end of the mm. day, and I think we've seen a lot of those sort of, I guess, arrangements work in more communist countries yes. where they are expected to kind of look after the parents as well and then the parents look after the grandchildren and it becomes this really kind of value-based experience. But mm. is that going to be, you know, something that I think, happens in New Zealand? I think it's already occurring. So we talk about the sandwich generation and the sandwich generation are those that have got elderly parents in the home but are also looking after adult children. And so there are costs there which are being shared, but um, very often the sandwich generation, it's their house that's being used for that. I think the other thing is that we're going to see the stock of rental accommodation grow because more people are going to rent rather than buy. Mm. We've typically had very high home ownership in New Zealand compared to most of Europe where you rent for a lifetime and you have safe rental agreements over that lifetime. So will our costs move us towards that European model or will we continue to have high home ownership? Yeah, I think it's an interesting one to, to get clarity on. I think that based on what we've seen with speculative investment in New Zealand and the way that our economy does mm. tend to be tethered to you know, home ownership, like even if you own a business and you want to take out lending, often the, the only way you can get that lending, unless you're sort of in a particular space where you can raise capital, is actually leveraging against a property that you own. So yes. it's so, you know, intricate and yeah. and interrelated in our economy now. So it's hard to think about how we could mm. all move away from that, yes. I guess. And, and, and can I go back to where we started around migration? Migrants, some of them at least, come with a big dollop of capital and they see home ownership. They're very into bricks and mortar mm. as a cultural behaviour and so they see buying here as being a way of establishing themselves here. But we see a lot of what we call transnationalism. So they still own the, the, the house in Beijing or in London or Seoul. And, and they will own both here and there. But they see 
buying a property here is a very important way of anchoring here, but they tend to buy at the top end of the market, many of them at least. Um, so we need to factor that in, particularly when we've got such high levels of inward migration. Yeah, because otherwise, I guess, with that sort of speculating on what that trend might cause, then you're going to get actually migrants coming in and purchasing the high-value properties mm. off the baby boomers, and then it's going to be a squeeze for anyone that's yes. sitting, yes. sitting below that <laughs> level. Yes. Oh, super. Yes. <laughs> and, and last year, the Productivity Commission did a very interesting report on the impacts of migration. They were asked to by the government. And they said we should call a halt to our very high migration levels and work some of these things out. And that hasn't happened. We've gone to not even high. We've gone to super high migration levels. And it's happened very rapidly through 2023. Yeah. So we've still got to have a conversation around that. You know, what, what sort of level of inward migration, which migrants, where do they go to in New Zealand? We need to have those conversations and then the impacts on things like housing. Yeah, and also for the migrants that maybe don't have that big, you know, mm. ticket or portfolio of investments, but actually how are we supporting them with housing when they get here, with yeah. employment when they get here, yeah. and what can that look like? Because I've been talking about the top end of the market, but of course there's a whole lot of migrants who can't and don't buy into our housing market. They've got to rent or who don't have the capital. So. We just need to be careful we don't generalize, overgeneralize too yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's the there's segments across every every part mm. of it, right? Whether you're a an existing New Zealander or you're a migrant coming in. Um, a new New Zealander. Yeah, a new New Zealander. That's yes. lovely, actually. I yes. like that. Very inclusive. Go. But yeah, when it comes to to that, I think it does go back to that trend, which is essentially, are we looking at housing as shelter or are we looking at as an investment mm. asset? Mm. And at the moment, how it stands, it's very clear that the vast majority of New Zealanders or those that can afford property are looking at it as both. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for most of us, when you look at the baby boomers, the household wealth is around 433000 which is very, very high. So that's the average wealth. And, of course, a lot of that is in fixed assets like housing. So when the Prime Minister had her uh, eve at 37, she's absolutely typical. More children are born to women aged 14 above than to women aged 20 below. In New Zealand last year. Yeah. You hear yeah. that, Mum? <laughs> <laughs> Is there pressure? No, it's not too much pressure, but it's, yeah, no. I think probably. It's one of those other discussion points, eh, you know? Yeah. I'm Do lucky. we say anything? When are they going to have kids? Oh, they're not going to have kids. Oh. Well, part of that, I think, I mean, it depends. You can totally rent and have a family, but yeah. I know that, you know, there are a few people as well that want to kind of still follow that traditional process yeah. of potentially yeah. buying a home and, and a there's something called the baby calculator, and the cost of having a baby in New Zealand is about $285,000, and that's to bring them up to the age of 18. Mm. So, And that's direct and indirect costs. So when you stop and think about that, house, baby, I mean, it, it, it becomes quite a trade-off. Yeah. yeah, and just trying to fit everything in. Yes. It slices my baby for the moment. Okay. So, uh, and the mm. way that, and as a result, the way that people in relationships are buying is happening differently as yes. well. Because once you add kids, it does become, you know, a bit more yeah. interrelated. But prior to that, if you're together for a longer period of time, if your parents are putting in a bid on a property, yeah. it can start to look really different in terms of how you want to manage that. And to your point, it's those changes to say we don't necessarily have the the processes in place to support with no, alternative kind no. of ownership structures. What we need to recognise in a demographic sense is the diversity of households now. I mean, you know, we tended to assume mum, dad, kids, and of course that doesn't happen anymore. We've got, you know, very diverse households, and those, and, and in fact the, the mum, dad, kids, typically dad being the income earner, is just not, a thing, really. It, it, it is a minority household type in New Zealand mm. in 2023. So how we live together, how we enter the housing market, how we live in houses, all of that's changing. How we manage our finances as well. How we manage our really, finances. Yeah, yeah, a really interesting one. What does our family look like? Are we interested in having family? You know, do we, when do we have a family? Do we trade off because cost of living, housing, Cost of baby, you know, there's a whole yeah. lot of things that are going on. Cost of wedding, cost of <laughs> cost of business. We do have a, a yes. bunch of, you know, people moving into that entrepreneurship space. And and, and, well. and when I look at the not gig so economy. much, yeah, 
not so much millennials, but some of them, but Generation Z are really entrepreneurial. And they're living their lives and, and, and living their lives in terms of employment or housing very, very differently. So I think we're going to see quite a different way of living mm. in New Zealand emerge. So when it does come to, you know, those migrants moving in, what kind of, what sort of support systems or community initiatives are there yeah. to support that? We're, we've not been particularly good. So we're really good at recruiting people. And we're probably better than Australia and Canada, but we're not as good as them at settling people. Yeah. So I've worked on various initiatives in terms of how you get people to adjust to New Zealand. And it's often about networks. It's often about colloquial English. It's, it's about understanding, in this case, how the housing market works. But there are some parts of New Zealand which are quite good at this. So the Welcoming Communities Initiative, which is funded by MB, has a number of centres around New Zealand, and I would identify a centre like Ashburton, which has got the Ashburton Trust, so it has a community trust, and around 2000, they decided that migrants were actually important to the rejuvenation of the community. So they're not only part of a government initiative, but they've got their own initiative, and they do a really good job. And I'm being slightly flippant, but, you know, suddenly the quality of the church choir improved. Wow. The quality of the local rugby team improved. And when we went and saw a primary school, almost half of the kids in that class were migrants or the children of migrants. So it rejuvenated those things like health, the demand for health or the demand for education. And the community kind of events and coming together. Yeah, and the yeah. community events are coming together. But when we talk about helping migrants, it's actually migrant organisations which are actually at the forefront so there's um, migrant organisations here in Auckland who absolutely help migrants into work and help migrants into the housing market and who provide migrants with housing. And one of the things that's going to grow is housing for older migrants. I mean, only around 5 6% of the population who are over the age of 65 are Asian, for example. Very, very small. But that will grow. And so these housing types, the new entrants, you know, perhaps moving into a new housing type, marriage breakup, household breakup, older, you know, there's a whole lot of things that migrant organisations are actually quite good at, at helping other migrants with. So that's sort of where that's happening right now, and mm. that there's not sort of this, like, I guess, national support system when it comes to no. identifying, we've got 110,000 people here, you know, where are we housing them? Yes, and, and I, what we did is we talked to migrants and, and we talked to, these are Chinese, Indian, Filipino, Korean, British and South African migrants. Some of them didn't have a lot of trust in the banking system, for example, and, and they didn't trust the banking system because they didn't feel that the banking system trusted them. So they would go to the banks that they knew, so offshore banks who are located here, or they would go to alternative systems. And what you notice is that there's quite a high level of lending within the migrant communities. So getting into, you know, perhaps a small business like a dairy or getting into the housing market quite often relies, as it does now for many others, in this case on the bank of mum and dad, it might be the bank of my co-ethnic or co-migrant mm. who helps me into those businesses or, or, or houses. So what you're seeing is quite a high level of co-ethnic lending or help, so financial again, help. yeah, alternative yes. methods into, yes. into housing and into business. And mm. it's really interesting because it's, you know, it's such a big group of people to think that anecdotally we... You mentioned earlier around them being really interested in new builds and anecdotally some of the, the property mm. developers that I've, I've been in conversation with have said, yeah, that's a lot of what they're targeting is their yes. kind of migrant audience. Yes. So if that's if they're going to new builds and they're kind of using their existing, I guess, you know, network to, to potentially mm. lend, then that's like the only kind of, real help that they're getting, which is actually pretty limited when you think about. Yes, it is. And, and what, what we, we need to doing. understand is as we look ahead, that migrant community, I mean, here in Auckland, about 43% of Auckland residents are migrants. And when you include their children, we're talking almost 60%. 
it's, it's, it's not a small number. And when we look at the current inflows, we're talking about a great percentage of New Zealanders who are migrants or the children of migrants. And, and as a, for example, over the next two decades, we'll see almost one in four New Zealanders a member of one of the Asian communities. Here in Auckland, it'll probably be around 38% of Aucklanders are a member of one of those Asian communities. And at the moment, three quarters of those Asian communities are migrants. And so it's a huge segment of our population, of our community, but also it has to have an impact on our housing market. Yeah, and we spoke earlier about, you know, Western versus sort of communism views and the mm. values around living with your parents and then having yep. grandchildren and then, you know, Asian communities are far more open to that. So yes. also that kind of puts further pressure in sort of some of those alternative pathways if you've got, you know, up to 60% being yep. migrants and having those different views and values around what housing can mm. look like or should look like for them, yes. which then makes us think, well, how should we kind of be approaching the housing crisis, actually? It's not sort of based on what, you know, New Zealand used to be. It's no. actually what it's going to be. And, no. and it's a very different yes. kind of look and feel. And my argument, Amy, would be that a lot of the ways in which we've approached these sorts of issues have been driven by very traditional values and practices. And, in fact, when you look at the new New Zealand, it's probably not going to work. So in 2023... The largest three incoming groups are from India, the Philippines, and China in that order. And all of them have a strong ethos of looking after family. So family welfare is really important to their, to their values. And, and you just are not going to see the sort of values, just, just to, to, to shoot off to the side, we tend to talk about New Zealanders and particularly New Zealand Pākehā as having neo-local values. That means that when you establish yourself in your own household, you move away from your parents. Whereas in Europe and in large parts of Asia, you live with your parents mm. and you live with your parents when you're married. You know, it's, it's, it's part of And as of you it. say, we're being forced to do that, a lot yeah, of us anyway. We are, yeah, we so, are being forced. So we're seeing that trend at that level, <laughs> yeah. which is a needs must, and yes. then we're also actually seeing the migrants and the different views coming and through. And the values and coming so through. And so they're going to want different things as yes. well. So what, you know, what can we be doing when it comes to housing yeah. infrastructure and development to yes. house the migrants, but also to enable, yeah. you know, the millennials and the Gen Zs into the housing yes. market? And, and I don't think we, we, I don't think we fully understand that. You know, we, we've done a lot of work on talking to migrants, and I think we've got pass, a partial picture, but actually, you know, it is only a partial picture. And I think particularly those that are New Zealand born and bred, they're going to be different again. They're going to be from, let's say, a Chinese or an Indian background. They're going to have some of the values of their parents, but they're also going to have some values of New Zealanders more broadly. But how are they going to act in terms of the housing market? I don't think we fully understand and what type of properties, you know, are fit for purpose when we're mm. building new builds? Mm. Are we building kind of two-bedroom new builds? Because perhaps that's not, you know, right if we are moving in an intergenerational direction. Yes. So, I mean, there's a lot of thinking to be done. And I think, you know, you will be talking in cabinet to people, so maybe <laughs> you should raise no, some flags. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I've advised various governments over the last two decades and, and unfortunately, our politics doesn't take a long-term view. Yeah. So when you look at the reports of the Infrastructure Commission or the Productivity Commission, and, and, and they've got some really interesting stuff to say about our housing market, by the way, they're, they're tasked with looking at 30 years. We tend not to look at 30 years. We tend not to look at 10 years. We tend to shoot for four. <laughs> yeah. Well, three years until the next election. Yeah. You know, it's like sort of – so it's a very short cycle. And, and, and that's what frustrates me. We, we saw a, a boom in migrants pre-COVID, a bit of a lull during COVID, and now without ever designing it, we've got this huge intake of migrants coming into the country. So we really don't think closely around some of these issues yeah. or carefully around these issues. Yeah, and that's the challenge. And, I mean, that's where Slice, we do try – try to address a, a lot of that through our processes and through mm. facilitating some of these alternative methods into home ownership. But, I mean, we really need to be seeing more as well at the infrastructure level. So it, yes. it does become a question of, you know, I mean, 
how can we kind of take that long-term view? How yes. can we as builders, architects, you mm. know, platforms, banks, mm. how can we kind of support the future of housing? And can I please, please say, when you're talking about those things, demography matters, and it matters a lot. Mm. You know, we, we, I think demography will determine a lot of these particularly as we get into the late 2020s and 2030s. Yeah, it will basically happen. Like at the moment, it feels that demography is actually driving yes. the, the well, outcome I, of a lot I of I would argue that yeah. that's the case. No, I'm with you, I'm with you. Yeah, but okay. I'm like, why can't these these organisations, these platforms, you know, mm. start kind of using some of that information, yes. talking to people, consulting, yes. and, and then taking that long-term view? Because yes. ultimately that is what we need in the housing market. Otherwise, it does just fall down to, yeah, demography, and that's essentially just what the customer wants, what what the needs are at the time. And it's very short term and it's responding to the demand this week or next month or this year. And I I just think that there's a longer process that needs to identify future housing needs and how we help people into housing because we need that variety. Yeah, yeah, and how you can encourage, you know, developers or architects to Mm. kind of... Yeah, move in that direction and start thinking future yeah. to the future of housing. Yeah, I think we're on the same page. I think we are. We are. Demography. Yeah, demography matters. <laughs> demography matters. I yes. think we can basically end yeah, okay, there, Good. Okay. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for joining our community. Buying property isn't easy, but listening in will get you one step closer on your journey. Please leave an Apple or Spotify review and provide feedback so we can improve your experience. Join our Facebook group, A Safe Space to Learn Together, or follow us on Instagram at Slice to Buy. If you have any questions or topics you would like us to touch on, you can email us at hello at slice to buy.com. A quick reminder, Slice the Podcast does not provide personalised investment advice. We are not acting as financial advisors or taking into account your circumstances. To get personalised advice, join us at slicetobuy.com and engage with our partners who can act as your financial advisor or lawyer and support you with your specific needs.